like to thank the family of J. Robert F. Swanson, a noted architect who, has also, who was also the son-in-law of Alil Saarinen. Each year, the Endowed Swanson Lecture Fund brings to the Cranbrook campus an architect, designer, artist, scholar, or teacher who has received critical acclaim for their work and enjoys a sustained record of excellence and achievement in their respective field. Swanson and his wife and life, lifelong design partner, Pipson Saren and Swanson, founded their firm, Swanson Associates, in 1947. They worked on many projects, including residences, schools, universities, churches, airports, banks, government, industrial, and commercial properties. Pretty much everything except White Castles. Marlon Blackwell practices architecture in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and serves as the distinguished professor and department head in the School of Architecture at the University of Arkansas. Working outside the architectural mainstream, his architecture is based in design strategies that draw upon vernaculars and the contradictions of place, strategies that seek to transgress, transgress conventional boundaries for architecture. Work produced in his professional office, Marlon Blackwell Architect, have received national and international recognition with numerous design awards and significant publications. He received a 2012 Architecture Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He also received a 2012 AIA National Award for the IMA Ruth Lilly Visitors Pavilion in Indianapolis, and most recently a 20, 2013 AIA National Honor Award for the St. Nichols, Nicholas Church in Springdale, Arkansas. He was selected by the International Design Magazine in 2006 as one of the ID40 undersung heroes. At the University of Arkansas, he has co-taught studios with the likes of Peter Eisenman, Christopher Richer, and Julie Snow. He has taught numerous visiting academic appointments uh, at Cornell, at the University of Virginia, at the University of Florida, Auburn University, Middlebury, Middlebury College, Washington University in St. Louis, MIT, and has also served as the Leal Saarinen, Saarinen Visiting Professor at the University of Michigan. In 1994, he co-founded the University of Arkansas's Mexico, Mexico Summer Urban Studio and has coordinated and taught in the program at the Casa Luis Barragan in Mexico City since 1996. Please help me welcome Marlon Blackwell. Turn on the technical device here. Everybody hear me? Okay, great. Well, welcome. Uh, glad to be back in uh, Michigan, back up north. I think it's actually colder where I am than it is here, so it's a, it's a kind of strange reversal. Um, and I, I probably haven't been here in about three years, but things have really changed. I was walking through the studios today at, uh, uh, in, in three years, I think uh, Bill's really transformed things. Uh, even though I know he's been here for four years, or isn't that right, Bill? Four? Yeah, a couple more. Yeah, yeah, but I, I see things evolving, and so the things are exciting. I got to see a few students this uh, afternoon, and I hope to see a lot more tomorrow. That's uh, still a, a vital and exciting place, uh, and, and great to be here. Uh, and as Fernando said, I, I live, practice, teach, uh, and build in Northwest Arkansas. We have a small firm, uh, there's seven of us, a couple. Uh, part-time. Um, you know, it, it's uh, the land of Bill, what I like to call the land of Bill. Uh, here we go. And the billion chickens That's uh, what we're known for. And of course, I, I, I love the chickens because I, I love the chicken houses. Uh, you know, being in the landscape, you can always know where you're at when you're wandering around in Arkansas when you see a chicken house because uh, they're always oriented east-west, almost always. Farmers are really smart out there. They realize that you know, by orienting them east-west, you minimize the eastern and western exposure, and then you can control the southern sun, and it keeps the chickens from cooking before their time. Uh, I like that kind of direct sort of connection, uh, the cause and effect, uh, and it's great lessons, good common sense that we try to learn from. And it's also uh, you know, a place that uh, we were asked to uh, kind of document in a, a recent, well, I wouldn't say a recent monograph, a monograph of our early work uh, by Princeton Architectural Press back in 05. And they said, you know, you really need a iconic image of your place. And so we think of the Ozarks, uh, and Fayetteville being, you know, really the home of the Ozark Mountains, as being that intersection of hills and valleys. 
Uh, so we, uh, the interesting thing about Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm from, is that it's the only town in northwest Arkansas that's built on hills. So you can stand in the downtown and actually find places where you can see cows and chickens and things way out in the countryside down in the valley. So we thought we'd find a, a place down in the valley where there's this intersection of the hills uh, and, the, and the lowlands here. And you can probably see a silhouette uh, right here on the hill. That's Old Main. That's the, you'll see that uh, figure uh, later in the talk. But that's the, the main campus building at the University of Arkansas. Of course, we found this cow with a newborn calf. And we thought, great, this intersection of uh, education and agriculture. And just as we went to snap the photo, in drives a Walmart truck. And so we, we forgot, you know, that's also uh, our place too, where it's the Ozarks are the cat home of uh, uh, headquarters of uh, Walmart. And so the whole idea of commerce, agriculture, and education coming together really kind of codifies uh, our place. Uh, and it's a place of real natural beauty and simultaneously a place of real constructed ugliness. And it tends to be considered to be in the middle of nowhere, but because of Walmart and Tyson Chicken and these other corporations, it's close to everywhere. So I can get on a plane in Fayetteville and have a direct shot here to Detroit and be here in an hour and a half. Uh, and we have more direct flights uh, to major cities than any other small uh, area uh, in the country. So there's, it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition. And you know, it's also a place that can be considered aesthetically and culturally uh, impoverished. And words like abandonment, exploitation, erasure, nostalgia, they're all aspects of this place. And our conditions I consider as authentic as its natural beauty and the local form. And it's a land of disparate conditions that is not just a setting for our work, but really has become part of our work. And what we've been able to do is, is find the positives, find the uh, deep source of possibilities in the flotsam and jetsam of where we're at, uh, and direct experience with the world uh, and the world as we find it. And by choosing to stay and work in what we like to call the Ozark Outback, uh, what we've been able to do is turn over the rock and discover the underbelly of our place, the second economies, those things that lie below the surface. Uh, and it's there that the visceral presences and expressive character uh, really uh, uh, inhabit, right? And that informs and sustains our efforts there. Now, I'm working from a, a simple conviction that architecture is larger than the subject of architecture. So what we try to do is look at the world with a wide-angle, microscopic lens to generate ideas and actions uh, from concrete experiences of the everyday between the ordinary and the extraordinary, uh, between one's own personal history and the history of our discipline. So we try to be very careful observers. And uh, just as a, an example, in Eureka Springs, this wonderful little mount town about an hour uh, north of Fayetteville, uh, you may recognize the building on your left, which is Thorn Crown Chapel by E. Faye Jones, who's the most well-known architect from uh, Arkansas when the AI gold medal, I think, back in 1990. Uh, fantastic work, protege of Wright. Uh, this is considered uh, to be in the top five best buildings of the 20th century built in America. Um, it, it, uh, we've taken everybody there, everybody from, you can take Liebskin there, we've taken Zumthor and Herzog and all these folks, and they all are just blown away by it. Um, it has this kind of enduring uh, sort of connection uh, to anyone. And, just a couple miles away is a place called the Passion Play, where folks and tourists come and, uh, to see the life of Christ acted out by actors. And, and they have this giant Jesus, like we like to call him Milk Carton Jesus. And he was designed to be really tall, and uh, much taller than he is now. But the problem with that, he was going to have to have a blue light on top of his head, a flashing blue light because of the FAA regulations. Um, and if they didn't want that, of course. So, but rather than redesign him, what these folks did, they just cut him off at the knees and slipped him into the ground, just pushed him into the ground. Uh, and, and thus we have, uh, affectionately, milk carton Jesus. They've got the proportions of a milk carton. So anyways, we live, we operate between the lows and the highs of culture. And the key for us is not to try to resolve one to the other, 
but instead to find a condition of resonance between uh, these, these extremes. And so we're constantly uh, being aware of that. And you know, these observations we make are both macro and micro, uh, geological, biological, uh, always cultural. And what they do is they, they form a basis for a bottom-up process uh, that allows us to amplify the small things that manifest the large things. Uh, and in this line of thinking, uh, I think we can say in, in the words of uh, the great poet William Carlos Williams is that there are no ideas but in things. And I believe as contemporary architects and designers, what this allows us to do is to confront some very critical questions. One is, how do we embrace the world without being consumed by it? And the other is how do we enrich and dignify the experience of being in the world for those who engage our work? These are questions we're constantly grappling with and trying to resolve for ourselves. Now, there's a great quote by Leonardo da Vinci who, you know, I think spoke directly about making from the experience of things when he said, it should not be so hard for you to look sometimes and, and, or stop sometimes and look into the stains of walls or ashes of a fire or clouds or mud or light places in which you may find really marvelous ideas. And effectively, that's all we're trying to do is that out of the muck of our own condition is to find some really marvelous ideas. And, you know, I think it's really safe to say that most architecture isn't very good. And most good architecture is good enough for most days. But there are some architecture, some buildings, that need to rise above the everyday. And I think this necessarily challenges us to realize the significance of the everyday and to revalidate it and to enrich it through the totality of the things that we make. And so we find ourselves uh, sort of choosing to work between the motivating forces of the everyday. Uh, and here the inadvertent meets the purposeful. Uh, and this kind of relationship is at once, I think, sometimes unfamiliar and strange. Uh, it uh, involves, in many ways, uh, for us, the task of recreating strangeness, of taking what we find in the world as it's presented to us and representing it, uh, incorporating oper operations that uh, allow for inspiration for new kinds of form, new kinds of types uh, that uh, involve a mixing, even a hybridization of the world as we find it and the, and the world as it's given to us. And I think what this is able, enables us to do in some ways uh, is through, through this mixing and this hybridization allows us to develop more virulent types, I think, that resist uh, the, and the commodification, let's say, of most uh, commercial development enterprises related to architecture. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're, we're, we're kind of after in the work. Uh, and always looking at these anal analogs or analogous relationships between nature and culture uh, and those intersections and, and, again, trying to find that condition of resonance between And you know, I've been doing this for a little while. I think our, our firm is about 20 years old now. And what we've been able to do, I know in preparation for the exhibit at the uh, Arts and Letters, was to reevaluate the work, to curate the work, and look at it as a body of work with its influences, its uh, you know, the, the progenitors and the progeny, and kind of do a whole family tree of the different types of uh, buildings that we look at, as you can see on the, uh, the far left, and then those uh, types from nature and, and how these things come together and mix to kind of produce a variety of project types uh, that may be underscoring certain ideas or principles that we're continually reevaluating, continually reworking with. And so it really is uh, seen as an evolutionary uh, uh, strategy relative to typology and to figures and how those things continually emerge out of the, again, the uh, muck of our own condition, the situation that we're presented with with each project. So 
I'm going to uh, show you projects that operate between the ideal and the more improvised in our discipline. And between this more, these more analog or analogous relationships between nature uh, and culture and between the environment and nature and culture and how those really are motivators uh, for much of the work that we do. So what they've been able to do over the years I, is to help us generate small projects. Here's our project that's a $40,000 project, a, a structure for a beekeeper in North Carolina with one single architectural element, a load-bearing steel plate and faceted glass wall that acts as storage for the honey, uh, it also acts as display of the honey along the roads because it's where it's sold, uh, but then supports the structure. It's really a load-bearing wall made of voids. So just one simple element. Looking again analogously at the textures and patterns of nature in this making of a tower house in Fayetteville uh, and, and being able to translate that into a kind of uh, material uh, tangibility. Uh, in this particular case, the, the striated bark of the white oak as it's then milled and then uh, reformatted into a white oak uh, uh, fin lattice that surrounds uh, the stairway courtyard but then stops at the mature height of the surrounding oaks. And then, of course, the white metal begins to take part in another order in the landscape, which I won't show you, but it's all industrial buildings made out of white metal and concrete. And we're constantly looking and asking the question, how might it be otherwise? What are alternative models that we can put forth uh, that would raise aspirations, which would uh, begin to change perception. In this case, a suburban office building that in a, in a recently annexed piece of farmland with, uh, it's like a gated community for office buildings that are supposedly supposed to all look the same. In this case, we threw the covenants out and we built what we wanted to and risked the chance of being sued. We weren't sued uh, and the building got to stay. or taking something that's really old it's in terms of a type, which is the uh, golf clubhouse. Uh, here we were challenged by the client uh, in a very particular way, said I, didn't wanna, I don't want another plantation house or another hunting lodge. I want something that feels like it came right out the ground here in the Ozark. So just using uh, natural locally quarried stone and copper, timeless materials, recasting a very traditional game and uh, in, a, in a new language uh, that speaks to its place. And more recently, uh, you know, a, a post-Katrina proposal, a prototype uh, for Architecture for Humanity uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi, which is the only town in the Gulf Coast of Mississippi that rejected the new urbanist plans uh, for the Gulf Coast and, and post-Katrina. Uh, Bilexi decided that not everybody wants to live in grandma's house with a geranium on the porch uh, and that maybe we could actually seriously take on the new FEMA regulations which uh, in post Katrina demanded that all structures built in the city limits be elevated above the surge line anywhere from 6 to 11 feet. In our case it was 10 feet, a particular site that was given to us. Uh, we were, there were seven houses built. Uh, uh, selected by families that interviewed, that looked at the proposals and picked one they liked and then they own land and then money from uh, the, uh, I think the Angel Network, uh, Oprah Winfrey and Autodesk, great combination, uh, came up with the money uh, to help get these houses built. Uh, so again, starting with type, which was a simple shotgun building, uh, we had to elevate that, but we wanted to keep the ones primary social interface, especially in the South, which is the porch. Uh, keep that intact on the ground, uh, and then rather than make a long shotgun with residual space underneath, because there's no way to really fill it, and it really compromises the urban condition, we cut it in half, stacked the program to have a more concise footprint, and wind it up with what we call the porch dog. Uh, and, and we also had to do this for market rate right about $130 a square foot. 
which is very different from what you see in the make it right houses, which are being done for about 450 grand for a house that's subsidized for a $30,000 mortgage. And their big calling card is they're all net zero. Uh, but I mean, who cares, in my opinion? You can't repeat them, they're not prototypes, they're unicorns. Uh, our, our idea was to make a prototype, so this is the porch dog. But again, seeing typologies as evolutionary, as dynamic. In order, if you, if you can look at it that way, then the figures that emerge are not fixed. They, they too evolve. And I think once the typo, typological becomes fixed, it becomes really about style. And I think that's where, uh, you know, especially the new urbanists architecturally fall down. Uh, they see it as something more fixed. Um, when I was a student at Auburn University, an undergrad, I told my roommate, uh, I boasted to him, said, I'll never own a house that I didn't design and build myself. And I had no idea that at that age of 25 that I would be 50 before that ever came around to happening. But it's not a good model. I rented the entire time. I don't recommend that as a financial uh, strategy. But nonetheless, uh, this is a house I, my design partner, my wife and I, Ati, uh, built back in 06. It's called the L Stack House. Uh, it's one of those lots that nobody wanted right near downtown, near the university. A 9,000 square foot lot, trapezoid to shape, with a creek that runs diagonally through it. And so we rented the house next door, lived there for a year and a half, observing the creek, how it flowed, uh, the nature of the site, uh, the vegetation, and came up with a scheme, took, after several schemes, that involved bridging and stacking as an operation that would minimize the footprint adjust to the one-story scale of the neighborhood, uh, but also allow for a 2,500-square-foot house uh, uh, to be situated in this very small site, and then also maximize the amount of land available for the children to play on. So the, the house literally bridges over the creek. As you can see, uh, this creek is a uh, traditional Ozark uh, spring creek that runs into another uh, uh, creek that runs into the Illinois River, so it's part of the Illinois River watershed. It's the only part of this creek that actually sees daylight. Most of it's culverted to the north. Uh, it's filled with crawfish. We found Indian arrowheads in it. So it's a, it's a living thing with a great history, a constructed site that uh, we wanted to, to be a part of. So just a simple 18-foot wide box that bridges over and then another 18-foot white box that or is oriented 90 degrees into the site. Uh, and you can see the streetscape, it kind of really, I think, works quite well. Kept us from getting stoned while we are building it because it's the only contemporary house in the neighborhood. But uh, it fits, nestles in quite well. Uh, the two boxes are joined together by a hinge, a stair, that's glass enclosed. So perceptually, you actually go outside to go back inside uh, to the upper bedrooms and living areas. What that gives you is a 1,000 square foot covered porch, uh, ideal for cooking and entertaining, and you know, essentially free space. And a line right along the creek, a uh, great place to sit and watch the water rise uh, during the storms. It's uh, kind of like watching a fireplace in a way. And for our firm, uh, we strongly believe that all details are spatial propositions. So, Doors, windows, columns, all have a spatial proposition embedded in them that one could actually perceptually inhabit, but even possibly physically inhabit. In this case, a window cantilevered over the street, over the stream uh, that uh, where my li wife likes to hang out. It's a day bed. Uh, she's uh, known as the queen of lounge in our neighborhood. So it's pretty cool. So the covered terrace. And then a critical detail. Uh, when you talk out conceptually about operations, whether it's stacking or bridging, you have to be very precise in the execution of the idea. So for us, the, the number one detail to resolve was right here, where these uh, volumes intersect. Three quarter inch space between, no more, no less. And from there, we detailed the entire house. So you're not getting an interlocking of construction. Uh, it really does feel like it's stacked and it has an independent floor, independent ceiling. And, and so we're designing with the end in mind. 
So, and detailing with the end in mind as well. Uh, the cro magnon rain screen, uh, I like to call it, it's the most labor-intensive rain screen ever made, I think. Uh, cover the house in rubber, uh, put a series of uh, struts uh, that uh, create a, a space for gutters and downspouts, and then a jig that's uh, attached to the struts uh, with a, a type of uh, water, water stop, water block, uh, and then that jig allows you to put one by two uh, Brazilian redwood, stacking it up just like stone, and then you toenail it from below. Um, and then I paid a guy a lot of money for three days to paint every screw, 13,000 screws black. So he asked me to lose his, uh, lose his name after, the, uh, after he was done. So. An interior very open. Just very simple spaces, queen of lounge, they're thrown right there. Upstairs, r rather than just use the hallway as a hallway, we try to kind of economize and use the circulation spaces as places for study, places for entertainment for the children, and of course in their own rooms, uh, places for activity, again, in the elements. Uh, my son, of course, initially was quite traumatized by having to change his pajamas in front of this major piece of glass. Uh, we got him a, a button with a shade that rolls down, so hopefully he won't be too scarred by that. These are supposed to be funny. You can, if you can, you can, you can smile. It's okay. Uh, and the money shot. More recently, and we just finished a small Montessori school uh, in a floodplain in the uh, First Streamside Ordnance Building in Fayetteville. Very difficult to build on this site. Uh, it's a, uh, a very, like I say, uh, challenging building because the footprint of what we were given after the floodways and the flood zones and everything taken into consideration was essentially a triangle. And there just aren't a lot of triangular buildings in the canon of architecture. It's a kind of hard thing to resolve, I find. Uh, but just using second growth cypress and a a box rib metal system that we like to use, uh, we were able to overcome it by essentially turning the V uh, or the triangle into a V, essentially two crossing boxes. And so one edge of the box hangs over into the flood zone with one column, and we're able to kind of get all the uh, needed program uh, into this uh, suburban streamside site. And kind of get a sense of, uh, of the site here where, we're, where we were confronted with. So that's what we had to build. There's a dentist's office right there, so we had to be very careful. And we had to provide rain gardens along here that keep water from going back into the stream uh, and then not inhabit any of this general area of the flood zone. And our favorite detail came right here where we had to take a, a piece of trim to go from 60 degrees to 90 degrees seamlessly uh, in the box rib. Uh, looks much uh, simpler than it was to actually accomplish. But you know, we take great pride in just taking off-the-shelf systems and you know, inducing a level of craft uh, in terms of how they come together and, and, and for the workers as well as how they deal with them. And then just some other features of the green roof. Uh, so it's a, it's a great learning tool for the, for the kids. But again, motivated by the parameters of what we're given in the site and then trying to resolve that. So the, the, the environment really becomes drivers, the forces of nature, whether we allow it to imprint itself physically on the building or drive it conceptually. We're constantly uh, uh, trying to be attentive to that. Uh, more recently, uh, in the Indianapolis, the uh, Indianapolis Museum of Arts, uh, Art and Nature Park, uh, it's a 100-acre art nature park right on the estate uh, of the museum, right near downtown uh, Indianapolis, right almost in downtown Indianapolis. A very difficult site, a very volatile site between land and water, lots of invasives. This site has evolved over time from woods to pasture to quarry to lake, 
and now to an art park for art speci uh, site specific art. What we were asked to do, uh, working with uh, landscape architect Ed Blake and environmental artist Mary Miss, is uh, to develop a series of pathway journeys and places for art and one particular structure, uh, a uh, visitor center, which would act as a uh, respite in the woods, a place for uh, interpretation and a place uh, as well to, to rest in the journey through this 100-acre uh, work of art. So very, very briefly, the, the site, uh, this is the museum, the old Edward Larry Barnes Museum that's recently added to. Uh, we're in an oxbow of the White River that runs through Indianapolis. There's also a canal, a 10-mile canal that was built at the turn of the century. Uh, so it's effectively an island. And you can see uh, back in the 60s when, when this was more of a field and they're just starting to turn it into a quarry, which is now filled up with water and become an amenity, recreational amenity in the city. Our site uh, is right over here. And of course, the way we arrived at that was pretty quick, pretty, pretty easy. We had 100 acres we started with. You remove uh, uh, the lake, you come up with 61 acres, and then when you factor in all the, uh, uh, the flood zones, the floodways, and easements, and uh, setbacks, and all that, you had 0.67 acres to build on. So very simple to find the site. Uh, so one was here in this refuse mound, the other one was in this woodland area uh, with no particular view, but really a, a quite, uh, uh, how would you say, intimate uh, site. Uh, that one would discover along the pathways. So less of a primary destination, but more as an extension of the journey uh, through. So this is kind of an aerial of the, of the site itself. But this is what's ha happening uh, quite a, often uh, on the site. And this is, uh, they've had three 100-year floods in the last six years. This is due primarily to, uh, I think, some poor development happening upstream of the, the river. And this is the river which has risen above the lake here and breached into the lake and then uh, breaches again out of the lake back into the river. Uh, so it erosion, uh, very volatile site, and it's you know something that we had to contend with uh, on our site. Some of the different aspects, the, the journey uh, pathways, the different types of art you might find, different public spaces that Ed came up with, and trails and paths. Uh, and then our site, a well, really wet, fecund site, uh, and, and uh, you know, filled with water at times. So uh, the challenge was, how do you situate a building in here that has to be out of the floor of the forest by five feet and not be something that's on stilts at eye level? So working very closely with the landscape architect, uh, Ed Blake, he looked at the plans we were coming up with, uh, which uh, attempted to use ramps as a way to r help you rise out of the forest floor uh, to the proper elevation and, and really act as a, a kind of angled fo uh, folded surface. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But his idea was a series of figured mounds, uh, like Indian mounds, that would rise up out of the uh, forest floor. And those would point to particular views through the forest. So very, very simple, and then it provides some outdoor spaces as well. And we looked at a lot of different things, in particular, uh, the idea of the, the butterfly, which is a kind of papillon, it's a French root word of pavilion, and a light structure. So we looked at it molecularly. We looked at uh, leaves that I found that had been eaten away by insects on the side. I pressed these in my sketchbook. Uh, and I love the idea of the porosity uh, of, the, of the surface, yet at the same time, the uh, you know, the legibility of the structure as well. And I thought, w what about if we could have a building that was porous that would allow light and water to move through it, much like the canopy of the trees? Uh, so that was the basic kind of motivation. Um, so we were thinking of one surface folded over to encapsulate the program, one material, one detail. Uh, so we do a lot of, I would say, very complicated animations. I'll go through this really quick in our office. There's the idea. Okay, done. Um, so if you missed it, I'll go back. Here we go. There we go. So in any event, so this was the, the thinking about how this would be accomplished. And, and then what we would need to do in order to 
keep you in constant contact visually and physically with that surface is to provide an exoskeleton to support it and create a very porous uh, type of building, both above you and below you. And that was particularly important with the deck. Uh, uh, you know, you had to get it by code, so in order to fill the gaps between, uh, we introduced uh, one by two inch uh, acrylic bars, uh, which uh, allow you to make it as a walking surface, but also hold light uh, and, and allow you to light it from below the evening. So you really get this sense of this thing being an apparition in the woods uh, in the evening, especially at dusk. And of course, the presence of this heavy structure is primarily understood uh, through its shadow as it's imprinted uh, through the screen of the canopies and the floors. And acts as a shade structure uh, and, and uh, you know, an outdoor place to be, whether it's winter or summer. And those mounds also provide a kind of a function of channeling water, the flood waters, to keep it from going, moving up into the building. So you, you're sort of accelerating the flow of water uh, as it moves through during a flood. Uh, and it's, of course, it uses geothermal and passively heated and cooled if necessary as well. You get a sense, all these are like ADA ramps that rise up out of the, uh, uh, out of the forest floor and then back into the forest. And all the wood is allowed to weather to silver, with the exception of this blackened wood you see here. That's all charred wood. We uh, used the, the sojibu, kind of Japanese process of charring, and then oiling uh, the wood, uh, which will be done about once a year. And so it's the one uh, material that comes off as immaterial uh, in the setting, and then the rest weathers around it. The inside is all water popped, ebonized white oak, uh, local material, uh, kind of more polished, like a piece of the museum broke off and came down into the park and sets up the views. And of course, behind the, the wall is all, all the bathrooms, the kitchen, and other services for the park. And then you can get a sense of that juxtaposition between the underside and then the exoskeleton. Uh, both the space below and the space above. And then the, the process of uh, charring the wood, so something anybody can do. It's a great way to fire retard the wood. So they were using uh, ironwood for prim the primary uh, wood surface, which has got a fire rating of concrete. Uh, and then by charring the wood, you fire retard it. So you have a wood building that's really uh, not that flammable, which is something a museum wanted. Uh, an interstitial space between the wrapper uh, and the, uh, the interior spaces, which has become uh, a recent phenomenon where uh, people come to get engaged. Uh, so if, you're, if, you have a, if you have a mate and you're thinking about that, this is a place where it's happening in Indianapolis. So I don't know why, but it's happened three times already. And just some parting shots. So again, nature as an analog is a motivating force, and this is something that we've taken further now into interiors. We don't get to do interiors that much, but when we do, we, we really try to think very deeply about how we make a system rather than just a surface uh, uh, for, for uh, an interior proposition. So this opportunity is, uh, came to us uh, really from the uh, Walton family. Uh, uh, Alice Walton was building a, a new American art museum. It's the first major American art museum built since the Whitney in New York in the last uh, 40, 50 years. It's an astonishing collection of American art. Um, the museum is done by uh, Moshe Softy. It's in Bentonville, Arkansas, of all places. Uh, and it's driving the art world nuts because you know it's supposed to be in New York or San Francisco or LA and it's here. Uh, they were supposed to have 250,000 people to visit their first year, they had 650,000. It's been a huge success and is allowing people who might not normally step into a museum uh, opportunities to come to a museum to learn, to see art in a new way. And so I think it's transformative culturally for our particular area. What we were asked to do was the museum store, 
And we had to kind of conceive it while it was under construction, the, the museum itself. It's called Crystal Bridges. Uh, it's a series of bridges and uh, buildings along the edge of a dammed stream, not far from the downtown square of Bentonville, uh, Arkansas. Uh, so it sits right, right here, kind of nestled down in a, in a valley. It's got a great James Terrell that comes with it, uh, another uh, a building uh, on the campus and artworks. Our, our particular piece is right here in the orange, uh, kind of strange uh, figured shape that we had to resolve. So the museum as it is today, but at the time we didn't really know quite what it was gonna look like. Uh, uh, this is the, the dining room. But we knew they had a great collection of art and we wanted to tap into our local resources, the material culture of our place, uh, as well as, you know, ideas about rhythm and about seriality, uh, works that you could find like uh, Thorn Crown. Um, and this is what we were given to start off with, not the ideal space for a retail. Uh, and, you know, especially with columns every 10 feet that are holding up a, a, a big green roof up above, it was just something we really had to, initially we fought it, but we finally kind of came around that we were going to have to work with the curve and, and the western uh, facing glass and try to resolve it in some way. So uh, what we did is began to look at some of the local artists that were going to be featured in the museum store. So we're looking at local materials, we're looking at local craft, um, and it allowed us to help understand uh, certain relationships that we could impart to uh, the museum store. In particular, looking at the basket work of Leon Niehaus, who's a nationally famous basket maker in Huntsville, Arkansas. Uh, and we, we looked at a lot of his baskets and went to a studio and we noticed that he conceived everything in profile. And then his operation was to extend uh, the profile along a path and then as it closed in on itself, he would then develop some kind of detail, some kind of flourish that would provide it with a very specific identity or character. So this operation of uh, profile and path is something we took forward uh, by developing uh, in section a simple profile that would resolve uh, the, the western sun, knock 40% of that down and create uh, a canopy or carpus, uh, a carapus that uh, would cover all the lighting and the sprinklers and the ductwork and kind of reconfigure the space, give it a variable scale, and then embed merchandise in it uh, and, and really create a whole new environment that acts as an extension uh, of the museum experience. And eventually these uh, manifested themselves as a series of ribs, 280 ribs out of 480 sheets of local cherry plywood. Uh, so we're using cherry uh, for the, uh, the perimeter, the envelope and then a walnut for the gondolas and vitrines for the merchandise. And, and then we knew that this would have to be digitally fabricated, so we found a local fabricator. We work uh, primarily in BIM in the office, so we could work directly from our files to uh, the, 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 uh, the three-axis CNC, and we actually designed in the connections and everything is sort of integral. Uh, and because of the way we organize the ribs in the space, every rib had to be different, and it's made of two to four pieces. So the CNC allowed us to customize and save about 50% on the budget. So we were able to do this project for $600,000, uh, which would have, I think we, the contract told us cost well over a million to have done it by hand. So the customization worked in our favor as well as the process of making. Uh, this is in the UDI's uh, uh, shop as they, Everything's put on an optimizer, so we minimize the waste. We even can mill in the, the connections for the different components of the rib, and then going in place here. Uh, very kind of tedious, painstaking process, but something that went up in about six weeks. But once you're done, that's the project. And the light, the way in which it baffles through in the late afternoon is really quite nice. It creates a, takes something that's really a negative and makes it more of a positive as it animates the interior. And of course, as, like any good architect, we're really good at post-rationalization. Uh, most of the students should know what that is right now. 
uh, which, you know, so the guy in the office was looking at this mushroom and said, man, you know, what we're making looks like a lamella, the underside of a mushroom. So we're like, yeah, that's right, man, that's cool. Uh, and so, you know, and of course now things in nature tend to radiate, they're, you know, they're radial, it makes sense, obvious. You couldn't do that the way we want to do things in our floor plan because then the gaps would be wide, feet, feet wide rather than inches wide at the back wall. So we made straight lines cutting across uh, the curvature and that's what created the uh, need for customization because every unit had to be different. Uh, simple plan of you know, just floating vitrines and gondolas and merchandise, a series of figures uh, encapsulated by this uh, hanging envelope uh, and, and, and different types of uh, merchandising uh, comes with a different type of display case or vitrine or gondola. So those two are, are customized. Just some of the different images and components. The cash wrap. And then the ability to, you know, like say, embed merchandise in the wall. So it really is a totalizing uh, environment. And what Alice Walton loved about it is that this uh, shop paid for itself in four months. So it uh, earned $2 million its uh, first year uh, in business. So she, and, and the, so it's $600,000, something like that, in the, in the first four months. Commercial break. There's only about three or 400 left. Uh, Amazon.com, and if you get it, you get this eight by 10 glossy picture of a former Bible salesman uh, trying to look like Dirk Diggler in the, in, in the 70s. So uh, I would rush out and get this immediately if you can. So. And it just demonstrates that anybody can survive uh, the fashion of the 70s as well as the music. So. Yeah. And of course, I do challenge the students to look back 35 years from now in terms of what you're wearing today and let's see what kind of reaction you have. So. So uh, the second part of the talk uh, really is about uh, an idea around repurposing. Um, back in post-war in Fayetteville, uh, uh, the family, the Fulbright family, if you've heard of William Fulbright, the senator of Fulbright Scholarships, uh, his family owned a mill and they made farm utensils, plowshares, wagon wheels, that, those sorts of things. Uh, and there really wasn't much of a need post-war for this. They were trying to figure out what to do with all this uh, stuff that they were making and what they were programmed to make. At the same time, an architect from Fayetteville was building the first fine arts complex in the country on the University of Arkansas's campus. His name was Edward Durrell Stone. Uh, and his family and the Fulbright family were friends. And he had an idea, he says, what if we took the components from your mill, the, the plowshares, the things that you make, the, the wagon wheels and such, and we convert these into an international line of furniture that would be displayed in this fine arts complex. Uh, and so this whole series of images speaks to that repurposing of material uh, and elements uh, to find new uses, new vitality. These are all from uh, the Getty, uh, from uh, the museum there. The, the, the images come from there. And using the local craft, I've already talked about basket ma uh, making, and that's part of our culture there, and using that to move these things into the future. So you hear the word sustainability and all the kind of greenwashing and things that go around that. But in our place, there's a lot of fabric, and I think it's appropriate. I wanted to show these projects. I knew I was coming to Detroit, and you know, I talked to several of the students today, and it seems so much of the studios about, you know, adaptive reuse. Looking at the, again, this leftover zones of places, existing buildings, uh, ruins, in effect, and how they might be repurposed, how they might be re-inhabited, and again, asking the question, how might it be otherwise? Um, so I want to show you a series of projects that are just taking existing conditions, adding to them, reinventing them in some way through some sort of operation. One in particular is the Gentry Library in Gentry, Arkansas. Uh, this is a very small town, 2,500 people, uh, not a wealthy town. It has one industry in it, a Little Debbie snack food plant, uh, and a wild country safari zoo 
where you drive through the landscape and monkeys jump on the car and ostriches chase you down the road and stuff. So it's, it's kind of a crazy place. This is Main Street, kind of run down. It's kind of, you know, a little bit secondhand. Uh, but there was a library board there that was very enlightened. They had a public library that was privately funded because there's just no money. But they had the dream of having a larger public library uh, that they could be proud of, that, a community room, a place to showcase historical artifacts from the city, a genealogy space. Uh, they were really motivated, and they were able to get a, an old hardware store, a 100-year-old hardware store in the corner of Maine and Collins uh, in which to locate this new program. Now, uh, this building uh, looked like this when I saw it, which is essentially a boarded up building, a, a, a ruin in effect, that had been hit by storms. Its parapet, which was, you know, this was built at the turn of the century, had been blown off. Uh, I mean, it was just terrible. And my first response, you know, thinking I was being responsible, was say, look, the best thing you can do is tear it down and start over. It'll be a lot cheaper. And the library board guy was really offended. I mean, it's just like, oh, no, we can't do that. I mean, there's great sentimental value here. This was the economic and social hub of our city for nearly 100 years. And then the mayor piped in and he goes, yeah, I used to eat barbecued beaver in the front room when I was a kid there. You know, you just can't do that. I didn't know you could eat barbecued beaver I, or, or eat beaver. I don't know. But uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, it was a challenge because they didn't want it pastiched, you know, like providing it with a history it didn't have. At the same time, they wanted a new identity. So how do you provide the past with the future? And so after a great deal of thought and, and trial and error, it kind of came upon the idea that this, really, this building really is an artifact, in effect, uh, part of the history, and we'd have to represent it in the same way that you know, a pocket watch or a bank safe or other types of artifacts might be represented in a particular way. It elevates their significance out of the everyday. So uh, coming up with just a series of de details, these soap bubble details where the glass sits in front of the brick, you don't put windows back in the openings, but you leave it as a ruin in effect. And you develop a, a syntax of columns and windows and doors and storefronts that provide uh, new expressive character through the arrangement, through the vocabulary of elements. And we had to do this for $108 a square foot. It's the least expensive library built in the state of Arkansas and also the first winner of a national AIA library award. So it, 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 it sort of, I think, the thing we like about it is it demonstrates to the public and I think to other architects who are constantly bemoaning, well, if I only had more money, I could do this. Uh, and, you know, there's a certain level of bovine scatology when you hear that from these folks. I think th the bottom line is it's not about economics. It's about will and, and your will to see it uh, through no matter what. It took us seven years to get this built. But we believed in it. Uh, the mayor believed in it. Uh, this is the mayor. It's a tough town. Uh, and this guy owns a tattoo parlor. So don't mess with him. Uh, but great guy, Wes Hogue, helped us through all the small town politics uh, and, and, and was, like I say, remained committed all the way through. Uh, and we were able to, just to take the, uh, uh, like, again, and just remove all of these elements and make custom new elements. But that was it on the building. That's all we could do on the north elevation. Uh, this thick and wall becomes the uh, place for books on the inside. We have the community room here and then a little pocket park the little Debbie Pocket Park, you know where the money came from, uh, a plaza in the back, and then future home for an antique fire truck. And a simple drawing here just shows you the kit of parts, the elements that we came up with, and how they situate themselves uh, in this ruin of a building uh, to recast it in a new light uh, with new character. I really uh, taught interface, transparent interface between the reading room and the stacks and the street, uh, the lateral bracing for these steel uh, fins, which are all load-bearing, uh, actually is where they place books and new journals. And so it's really, in a lot of ways, like turning a building uh, inside out, uh, top and bottom. 
uh, locally made furniture. Uh, and then these press tin ceiling is something we really couldn't violate. They didn't want it. They wanted it preserved. So we had to, we used county prisoners to take down each tile, number them, and they were restored. Uh, we put the HVAC in the walls. No lights were punctured through. Uh, we had to provide new columns, so we built these real nice Mesian columns, wrapped them in books, wrapped them in glass, and then light, and then the light hits the ceiling, bounces down, and creates a kind of uh, a diffuse light that provides the reading light uh, for the re reading area. You can see the old pictures from before and, and then after. The old mechanical lift becomes an exhibit uh, piece. Used to take buggies from the top, hook them up to horses on the bottom when they sold them. Uh, and there are lots of little uh, nooks and crannies like that that become places for exhibits. The librarian's office, new beacon on the existing skylight opening. And just simple uh, windows that are designed inserts to capture north light and to bring a kind of more spiritual dimension into a more prosaic uh, condition. And the thing I think that we're most proud of uh, when we talk to folks about this building is that when they started, they had 300 library card holders in the town of Gentry uh, back uh, in 2000. Uh, today they have over 2,300 library card holders in the town of 2,500. So it really has become a city center and has become a, a real success and I think uh, provided a seed project for the whole revitalization of Main Street. And that's, I think, the power of architecture uh, in the most uh, fundamental way. Uh, another example is a church we recently uh, uh, completed in Springdale, Arkansas along the interstate 540. You can see it right from the interstate. Uh, a congregation of Eastern Orthodox Christians came to us. Uh, they had a congregation member who died and left them $450,000. They took $300,000 and bought three and a half acres uh, that included a house and a metal welding shop and took the, other, the rest of the money and took some money from the bank and came to us about building a, a sanctuary and a fellowship hall for about 100 bucks a square foot. And uh, I mean, we were quite excited about it because, it's, you know, it's a spiritual program. It's one of those honorific programs you mostly get to do in school but rarely get to have a chance to do outside. Uh, so it's located amongst all these other mega churches here, right? and there's lots of adventures in religious architecture where I'm from. Uh, Interstate 540, uh, City Park won't ever be developed. Uh, this is what they wanted for 100 bucks a square foot. Um, of course, I'd say, well, that's really not quite possible. This is what often, uh, you know, is understood as religious architecture where I'm from. Uh, lots of metal buildings with crosses hung on them. And not exactly the uh, house of worship. The, uh, you know, I, the funny thing to me about when I see these things is I know people don't live in these things, wouldn't live in one. I've seen people pull up in cars that cost more than these buildings. Uh, so it's, it, it's an interesting set of values that's on display here. Uh, one can quibble with it depending on your denomination, but the bottom line is it's, I don't really understand it as a gift uh, in the way that uh, originally was to be understood, the house of worship. In any event, uh, unbeknownst to us was that they wanted to do sanctuary and fellowship hall, and it had to start with this. We, and we were like, stunning me, we're not tearing it down. He goes, no, we don't have the money. So we had to transform this shed uh, into a church. And the way in which we did that, again, is just through simple principles, in this case, proportioning, classical Greek proportioning, uh, that would allow us to give it uh, appropriate scale and dignity. And we added 10 feet to the front of this building, metal building, uh, and then managed to convert the whole thing. Uh, all for about 100 bucks a square foot. And so that's just, that was accomplished through simply reskinning the building. So we actually have a, a true American double skin system. The Europeans can eat their heart out on that one. Uh, added, you know, the 10 feet to so this frontispiece with all the icons and the, uh, the references to the rituals and traditions of the church. They're in the public face of the building. Uh, which also acts as a, as a kind of billboard to the interstate. It's 
so it can be easily seen amongst all these mega churches. Uh, from the park in the back, very simple, controlled uh, lighting. And then very precise detailing again. We're taking an off-the-shelf box rib, uh, seamlessly letting it turn a corner just by coursing the metal. So we, we actually dimension the building in such a way that it courses out with the metal. It's very, very precise. We love this. I love this detail. This is the fire exit door, but we, we put that here so we know where it is. Simple section through the new addition. Father John's office here. This is the narthex, which runs north-south so they can get you back on axis for the sanctuary to run east-west, which is very important to this uh, particular denomination. The blood of Christ sort of pours down on you in the morning where the light hits the red glass. Uh, this was the baptismal area here, which they couldn't afford to complete, so it's become the choir area. Whoops. So Narthex, pick up a candle. This is, that's the return air duct, which actually has a cabinet. A steel tray filled with sand, candles, pick one up. Uh, then you arrive on axes and move into the sanctuary, confronting the iconostasis and the different lighting effects. And very traditional services with incense and a very aesthetic form of worship. Father John here with this iconostasis, which is very transparent, <coughs> so that you can see him behind at the altar. <coughs> and one of the things that's really important was the manifestation of a dome. They had to have a dome, and it was like, oh, man. Uh, we can't put a dome on this building because you'd have to cut through the beams, which they couldn't afford to do. So we had to think pretty hard about how they could get a dome and that could be affordable. Uh, so our contractor had an idea. He, he knew a place where he could go with two cases of beer, and we could trade it for a satellite dish. Uh, and, and so what we did is we gave this guy two cases of beer, got the satellite dish, and then we trucked it all the way back to the church where it was under construction. <coughs> Excuse me. And kind of documented this whole pilgrimage back. And then it's got its own laugh built in, right? So skim-coated it uh, and, and put it back up there. There it is. So, And, you know, I told Father John, I said, man, you got a direct connection to God now. And... <laughs> He said, yeah, but it's pointed in the wrong way. And I said, yeah, that's true. Uh, but he said, no, but I get your point. And, and then there was another guy on the building committee who got caught up in the spirit of all this. And he's like, yeah, I know where we can, uh, we can get a chair for the bishop when he comes to sanctify the space. It's a big wooden chair with crushed purple velvet upholstery. It would be perfect. Uh, and he says, I can get it for free. And I said, where can he get it? He says, oh, I'm going to get it from the local liquor store. It's part of an ad campaign. Uh, oh, he says, but I don't know what we're going to do about the embroidered CR on it. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, you know, Crown Royal. Father John was there, and he said, oh, no, Christ the Redeemer. So anyways, that's how it rolls in Arkansas. Uh, so in any event, uh, this building won the World Architecture Festival in 2011, best civic and uh, uh, community building. Uh, and we're very proud of it. And it's, it's really just uh, gotten a, a lot of attention, something very simple, very straightforward, uh, using fundamentals that we all learn in school, scale, proportion, uh, you know, uh, fidelity to craft and thought. And amazing things can happen. Currently. We're working with another existing building, which is our own architecture school at the University of Arkansas. We were fortunate to get the commission for this project, which is a renovation of 70,000 square feet of existing uh, space. But this is the old Beaux-Arts library that we've been in for the last 40 years, and then a 35,000 square foot addition of new studio space, auditoriums, uh, and uh, offices uh, uh, to the building as well. 
and it's uh, currently uh, under construction. It's right in the middle of campus. This is Old Main that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, it's on the main axis, runs through the campus. The problem with this uh, building here, our building, was that it had books right in the middle of it, uh, the reference area. So you could come down the main axis, come through the building, but then you had to go around, back outside, and then onto the main axis. What we've chosen to do is blow out the center of the building, rebuild it, open up that axis all the way through, and then add a second bar, the same width and length as this neoclassical bar, but obviously of a very different language. Let's see if I can, this thing's getting slow here. So that's basically the, uh, the, the site. Uh, and then the addition with the uh, addition of new uh, berms that were part of the original plan. This is all out of, the new addition is all out of Indiana limestone or rain screen, much lighter system than the existing building. So we're using the new building as a, in a very didactic way to teach students about uh, tectonics, about form making, uh, and just about the way we build and how we understand architecture currently under construction. And of course, we didn't ask for this, but we got a 200 foot long west facing facade where all the studios go, so we had to think about how to control the sun and also not look at uh, this building, which I consider Albert Speer comes to, uh, to uh, uh, Fayetteville. So really we consider it the ugliest building on campus. And of course, so how do you control the western sun and not have to look at this? So uh, we want to look out for our students. So we did a lot of sort of sun studies, uh, looked at the idea of a brisolet, a custom brisolet. We were using custom steel and glass uh, 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 curtain wall systems. And then this brisolet would be detached, uh, connected but detached, all out of uh, trans, uh, uh, fritted glass fins. And we finally came up with an orientation that was uh, here that would work best, uh, that was oriented back towards the north and then would block your view of this thing to the west for the most part. And we, you know, we like y'all, what y'all do here, we do one-to-one -one mock ups uh, So we sort of tested it. It uh, works actually quite well. Um, and that will be, it's going in right now. That's what these are the frames that are going in for it for the different studio spaces. All uh, post-tension concrete. And we're working with the concrete consultant that uh, Ando used on the Pulitzer Museum. <coughs> so we're getting some good concrete. Although I, I, not ondo concrete, but close enough. Ah, excuse me. So to get this past the design review board was uh, no small thing on our campus. Like most campuses, it's traditional and most of the facilities people could look through a keyhole with both eyes. So we had to come up with a sort of different way of coming at it. And then we, so we just kept leveraging it with the students in a didactic approach. So we showed him this diagram. We said, you know, traditionally, uh, the figure ground, a uh, way of understanding the language of a, a building was the, the building acted as more of a ground and the fenestration was more figure as well as certain kind of elements were the figures. So what we want to do is provide the students with a, a kind of inversion of this where the building is really the figure and the fenestration is the ground. And in that way, they have a kind of point of comparison. Uh, but they didn't really have an answer for that, and so uh, we got our building. So uh, it, it begins, to, again, using the similar proportions and scale of the existing building, uh, but decidedly new, all site cast uh, concrete with the uh, Indiana limestone rain screen, and then this 200 foot long uh, brisolet here, which at night will be uh, backlit and be very much like a jellyfish. You can see all the activities of things going on, at least being hinted at. And under construction, getting ready for the, the rain screen, a lot of zero edge detailing. And just uh, the central area that we kind of blew out here, preserving uh, the existing uh, detailing with one slice through to connect the new with the old. And then we're adding uh, studios on the top. So this is our sort of our BIM model and then the, the slurry coats uh, coverings to protect the detailing. 
And then the new space, this is what it looks like now, and that's what it will look like. And it has an eight foot by 20 foot oculus, uh, one piece of glass from Germany that we're using. Uh, and then the interior of that oculus is all level five finish red uh, gypsum and with red glass to match this red glass band where people upstairs look down into the oculus. This is all a uh, new mat ceiling. It's a fabric ceiling that's acoustically treated. Uh, when you turn on the light, the entire thing lights up evenly. So it's like a 2,500 square foot lampshade. It resolves all the lighting conditions. And then we're using Opalux on the side for uh, daylighting uh, in the space. So it really becomes our major event space, uh, review space, uh, and social space for the school. And under construction, finally got the glass in, didn't break it. Uh, there it is here, and then they're just starting to build that uh, the walls of the oculus as it looks down into the space below. And then the old reading room is being converted into uh, a great studio space, which it, it really has always been, but now for the first time we'll be a school with all three disciplines under one roof, landscape, architecture, interior design, and architecture. And this will be the lab where everybody's together. So. Uh, all been restored, replastered, new custom fixtures, hanging new uh, desk, uh, but still respecting the character of the old. All the single pane glass is kept intact, has automatic shades now that protect so you don't get that weird window, uh, storm window look. So that's currently it right now. New 200 seat auditorium, goes from one floor to the next. All will be wrapped in uh, a kind of gray felt carpet with a uh, fin ply uh, for the ceiling. And then finally, uh, of course, faculty offices, but a really nice outdoor covered classroom with views of the Boston Mountains beyond. So we'll be done in August and moving in and starting school, and it's a whole new future in many ways for our school, but again, we could have easily gone out on the edge of campus and started completely anew, and in some ways that might have been simpler, but I think repurposing the building, uh, in a sense, not abandoning it, but reusing it, adding to it, uh, rethinking it, continues its, its life and its significance and vitality. Wash U and St. Louis asked us to do a similar thing with proposal for their new addition to their architecture school. So we had to prove on a very conservative campus that you could make an addition to a Beaux-Arts uh, building that would be uh, complementary and at the same time uh, uh, have its own sort of integrity and identity. And it was approved, but uh, this building's been put on hold because it's deemed too small. They want to go much bigger now, so it has to go to another site. But again, it's a great exercise in, in looking at how we build with these existing structures. I've got just a couple projects I want to show you real quick. We've been uh, invited to do some urban projects. We've shifted up in scale uh, and putting together multidisciplinary teams. This is for the redesign of the Point State Park and the, the portal to that park in Pittsburgh, uh, which is right where the, uh, the Monhaga and the Allegheny Rivers come together. Very famous park. If you ever watch the Pittsburgh Steelers play football, they always show that on Monday Night Football, the big fountain. Uh, but what runs through this park is this interstate, lots of infrastructure, and right underneath it is a arch that creates the entry into the state park. It's very compromised, uh, really sort of nasty under there, and uh, not accessible, uh, ADA accessible or anything. So the primary part of this competition of ideas was to rethink how one might enter that, and so it really becomes something of an event. Uh, so we formed a team of landscape architect D-Land Studio, Susanna Drake, uh, Kendall Buster, a sculptor, Guy Nordenson, a uh, structural engineer, and Richard Renfro, a lighting designer, and developed a proposal that would complement the existing stadiums here, the, uh, the, the Steeler Stadium, the Pirate Stadium, and uh, a lot of people move through along the pedestrian walkways to these stadiums and along the edge of the park. So we came up with an idea of a cultural stadium uh, where already events happen, but we'd really start to move the museum up to the edge here, a new light rail uh, station here, and then the new entry into the park. 
uh, and then using the language or of the infrastructure, this uh, new green roofed uh, uh, canopy that seamlessly connects uh, with the, uh, the arch uh, and then provides the canopies for these other programs. And kind of being underneath that in this, this new park and then the, seeing the portal beyond, um, all done out of a, a, a kind of glass reinforced fiberglass. And then the portal itself is reskinned in a iridescent blue stainless steel uh, that not only wraps the opening but goes underwater uh, and forms a complete liner that's disengaged from the original structure. And it's held, it's disengaged with tension rods uh, from the original, which are, each have LED lights. And so at night it lights up and the old uh, structure begins to emerge. So you've got a kind of three-dimensional effect. So in the daytime, the iridescence uh, or the, the metal is reflecting light and water and creating an iridescence uh, in the blue stainless at night begins to light up and there's a series of lighting effects, everything from constellations to fireworks, whatever you can get going on through this. Uh, I was kind of reminded of this going through the Detroit airport, but I think it would be 10 times better. I'll just say that and what's going on there. Please let it be better. And then looking back out to the city from the portal. Uh, Fortunately, our, our scheme was, uh, you know, again, it's a, it, they said this is a competition of ideas, but whatever sticks we may go through with. We, our scheme was picked uh, along with uh, Kate Orff with uh, uh, her studio in New York uh, with a uh, way she's wanting to do the floor of this area and Maya, uh, a whole LED display on the bottom. So there's three firms now working together uh, and they just priced it out an $8 million project, which I think when you think about what the bean cost in Chicago, it's really not that much. I think the bean was 60 million or something like that. It's a ridiculous amount of money, but really great piece. Uh, any event, so we're hoping this will uh, move forward in time uh, as the city sees fit. Uh, another project we just finished for the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, our town grant, working with our uh, University of Arkansas Community Design Center, was uh, a creative corridor for Main Street in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, this was. It back in the uh, 60s, a really vital shopping uh, street, uh, commercial street. This is it today, com almost completely dead. Uh, all these trees here, which are kind of odd that great commercial streets really didn't have trees on them, but that's the way we kind of resolve things. So the idea for this project was uh, how to take all the disparate sort of creative arts uh, and institutions in the city and locate them uh, on one street, because the idea is big retail is not coming back to the, to the street. So if he brought the arts uh, and concentrated them in a four block area, uh, you could bring uh, you know, housing, other businesses, uh, offices, everything to revitalize it and keep it vital 24 seven every day and, and really bring it back to life. And so uh, as you can see, uh, this is the zone here, Main Street, and then Capitol was a very important intersection that terminates at the state capitol here. Uh, so the strategy we worked together on, and, and the Community Design Center really worked uh, mostly on the urban design aspect, was to develop a phasing strategy uh, where you build a series of gateways to kind of uh, mark off uh, the, the corridor area, and then uh, uh, you develop a center, a center plaza and a major anchor building, uh, and then uh, thicken the edge with a shared street concept uh, and then create a new transit district with street cars and bicycles and all of that and really bring it along a pay-as-you-go kind of strategy. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, how it uh, evolved uh, where they only lost eight parking spaces on the street. Parking is very important in Little Rock. I guess I don't know if it's important everywhere, but it probably is. Uh, and so we... we came up with a variety of ways to make these gateways, uh, to slow traffic down, to make it pedestrian friendly, uh, and really where cars, you never get rid of the car, you don't close the street, but you, cars and people can occupy the same space in a respectful way. And uh, developing, our job was to develop a series of infill projects on empty lots, uh, this idea of a culinary school with uh, housing on top and public spaces that interface well with, uh, on the street, uh, the idea of the porch again, the typology and then connection from that up to a second 
uh, floor uh, public space and really help the city and its leaders and its citizens uh, imagine what the future can be in the next 10 to 15 years and to raise public aspirations as well and expectations. And I think that's the value of these types of projects. And I think I'm really uh, thankful the NEA is around to, to provide the opportunities for design firms to, uh, to put these, these types of visions forward. Uh, another end of the uh, gateway again, where you're developing the street in this, in this case, uh, galleries and work to live spaces for uh, the city's artists and there we met with quite a we met with every property owner in the four block area and and artist groups and all the different creative arts groups so we got a lot of great feedback from them and developing the transept of the street and how that would relate uh, to the building itself and then just how the street might be at, in the evenings and use, again using elements to do more than just shed water but actually become lanterns and uh, great sources for lighting and animating the scale of the street. And then the, uh, the housing building, the other gateway. And then the anchor building, a, a combination of an arts program, in this case the, a big a series of cinemas uh, and a, a large single tenant office uh, tower. Uh, and then the intersection of that is a, at an auditorium that they share, a series of auditoriums, and then a great plaza below. Uh, and it really start to animate both the street level, but also uh, parking. Every building had to come with parking, 300 parking uh, spaces. So we put all the circulation uh, pedestrian to connect to the parking along the edge here to animate the vertical surface. Uh, so there's the plaza below uh, in, using both digital uh, and more kind of traditional forms of articulation. The tower ab above and how it begins to respond to existing fabric, uh, especially at the uh, more at the street level, uh, public spaces and the sky spaces on the top. And other types of infill projects as well as that are more speculative in terms of retail and offices and then their kind of uh, interface with uh, the existing uh, or the other proposed uh, structures. Anyways, it's really started quite a conversation in Little Rock, uh, both good and bad. The idea of a Fayetteville team coming into Little Rock is anathema. No Fayetteville team has ever designed anything in Little Rock in 40 years and been allowed to get away with it. I don't know if that happens in Michigan or not, but can you go to Grand Rapids or, or can they come here? I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's been a great experience to work at another scale and, and, and again, to, to demonstrate some conceptual agility in, 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 in how we work. Uh, working with James Corner's office, a, a lar largest urban park in the country in Memphis, 7,500 acre park, uh, developing a variety of structures to complement this new uh, extended, expanded lake and edges and park-like uh, setting that the Corner's office is developing. We're doing a new visitor center here and in restaurants and boathouses and stage pavilions. I, it's very early on conceptually, but I wanted to show you the visitor center because we just thought it was cool. It's got a 50-foot cantilever, 8,000 square foot porch, part of the visitor center with this great kind of perforated screen that's both a marquee and uh, a way of concealing uh, 32 big ass fans uh, that ventilate the, uh, the shade. So the coolest shade is that which is ventilated and those are spritzers in between so it mists and then it rotates and cools because Memphis gets really hot. Uh, simple diagram of how that works here with all the fans up through the canisters and then that's vented out through this photovoltaic array uh, that controls the lake levels, the evaporation that happens in the lake controls the water levels in the lake. And then final project, y'all have been very patient. I've only lost three or four. There's another guy leaving right there. He's acting like he can't hear me. That's all right. Uh, we've been asked to do another church in Bentonville, Arkansas, right near uh, the uh, Crystal Bridges Museum. It's yet another project where we thought we were going to do a basilica or something you know, more traditional for the Episcopal Church there. Uh, and the site said, no way. Uh, we can't do that. Uh, again, located right not far from the square of uh, Bentonville and Crystal Bridges. Our site, uh, I'm just going to give you some 
Here's the square, Crystal Bridges, and then our site right along Tiger Boulevard. Uh, great congregation. They're currently meeting uh, in a Lutheran church. So we've got Lutheran and Episcopalians hanging out. I'm a joke. I go, what's the joke? The Episcopalians are just Lutherans whose stocks did better or something like that. I don't know. But nonetheless, uh, our site bridges uh, kind of goes over the Tiger uh, Boulevard, two parcels here. But once we began to look at the terrain, a very steep site, the quality of the soils, the access, uh, the program, uh, the amount of needed parking, this is what we came up with that we could build in. 2,300 square foot triangle yet again. Can't escape the triangles. So we took a very traditional basilica plan and then transformed it uh, uh, to you know, situate itself in this footprint uh, with uh, an extended uh, over 100 foot long uh, porch that it allows people to come and be embraced from all parts of the parking area then find their way into an outdoor atrium uh, with sculpture. This is uh, currently being discussed with the museum about how they would display liturgical art. So there's gonna be sculpture and art displayed throughout the building. Whoa, something got reformatted. Well, it was a really cool section, that's all I can tell you. Can you all see that? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, kind of neat in a way, it's a negative. But, uh, we have this kind of figured section canopy that runs through it. And the entire building is mostly glass covered by a corrugated, although we don't want to say that, but a perforated architectural panel uh, that acts as a veil that wraps around the building. So here's a study model of that. And so it's really a disengaged uh, envelope over a white substrate with a, uh, large expanses of glass sitting on a, a architectural concrete base. Uh, then this pops up for the administration and then the, your, your atrium here. And then it terminates uh, in an outdoor garden uh, adjacent to the chapel and then the sanctuary and narthex are here. And then you have your fellowship, fellowship hall or parish hall and then all your educational wing over here. So basic organizational strategy. Uh, this is it with the, the white metal. So we're, we're kind of looking at a more ephemeral look and very luminous look uh, that kind of evokes mystery and at the same time a, a high degree of uh, uh, or translucency or legibility depending on what time of day or uh, that you engage it. So coming from the parking, this is the red door is very important as an entrance into the Episcopal Church. So we decided that we had so many doors we just make them all red. So there's probably eight or nine different doors along here. So we just make them all red. The primary entrance obviously being here, but on Sundays, you would enter through the courtyard, which you'd open up through with multiple uh, points of entry. Uh, and then once in the courtyard, uh, sculptures and so forth. Poor fellows, like, geez, this guy's boring me. Uh, up in the library, uh, looking down at the court. Man, just uh, killing me, this reformatting. So this is the larger section, as you can see, and we're creating a series of thresholds just into the narthex, so the choir loft that kind of rolls into uh, the narthex, uh, which acts as both narthex and art gallery. And then the chapel itself, uh, the series of uh, kind of embroidered sheer curtains over a uh, steel and glass curtain wall with the, uh, the metal mesh on top of that, so layers that you can adjust uh, from inside to out uh, to get the degree of translucency or ephemerality, but it still provides you with a view of the terrain beyond, but in a more muted way. And then a study for the chapel, we have a, a Hispanic community that's part, part, they have their own services as part of the Episcopal Church. Um, and so we started just by looking at this and then really developing another uh, kind of way of connecting with the sky and oculus that really acts as almost like you're being listened to, like an ear in this, that really kind of occupies most of the ceiling of the uh, chapel area. Uh, we've continued to work on that, and, and we've now kind of gone with more traditional materials of plank floor, uh, kind of lacquered plaster uh, walls with the oculus that now you don't connect to the sky, it's just the luminosity of light kind of working its way through, and then right at the 
uh, convergence of the point uh, cross and then the reflection of the other crosses in the side. So something, and then again, the candles and the Virgin of Guadalupe. So that's where we're at with the, with the project. It's coming together. Well, we've been surprised. We thought we were going to go through a big, uh, long, extended uh, fundraising uh, campaign, but they're going straight into getting a CM and, and, and start building at the turn of the, at the beginning of the year. So that's the view from the road. One last project. I, I'd heard that Todd Williams was here last semester. Was that correct, Todd Williams? And uh, you, you know, I just saw Todd and Billy uh, a couple weeks ago in, in uh, New York, and we had a wonderful invitation from them uh, last uh, summer, I guess it was, to participate in the Bin Alley. And I'm sure he might have shown you some of the Wunderkammer, but I wanted to show our piece at least to so, so to kind of complete his big project and our little insertion in that project. Um, and it, you know, he, they had invited 35 architects to you know, take these boxes and, uh, that had been made in New Jersey and shipped to each individual architect, and then you fill it up with those things that inspire you. Uh, so we decided to turn our box into a diptych uh, and make it an essay on our place. Uh, and uh, so both irreverent and reverent, uh, spiritual and prosaic, and made a series of chicken houses. So all of the things I've been talking about come back, glass chicken houses that uh, terminate in three chicken heads, skull heads, uh, that barn that you've seen that kind of, uh, again, the spiritual and prosaic together. One of our sons of Arkansas, Johnny Cash. Um, and then the, the terrain of Arkansas, the Ozarks, the valleys, it's all milled. CNC, a series of translucent fins that create the terrain. Uh, we had to work with the Jim Marshall family to get licensed to get this uh, image, which is really difficult to do, but we succeeded in convincing them of the merits of the project. So it has a kind of very three-dimensional. And then the lid, this being the lid, sort of nestles into this, and then when it arrives, you just unfold it, uh, and it becomes this uh, neo-medieval diptych. Uh, and then he might have shown you this, but the building where it was displayed uh, in Venice, the, variety, the different boxes that arrived all unfolded and then set into the context of these great uh, beams and shelves and columns. And so I started with our place, and I'd like to just sort of uh, end with our place. The thing that we found out about uh, when they, we, we received our piece back uh, is that the Italians loved this image so much they would rub the finger uh, of the people coming, so the finger is almost gone now. But uh, anyways, hey, thanks. Appreciate it. At least one or, or two, or even three. It's a quiet group. Usually they're, this kind of remind me of Mormons. A bit, uh, <laughs> no offense to Mormons, but I, I gave a talk in Salt Lake and it was like, every joke was just, do we laugh? Can we smile?